All right, so I've played a lot of Wayfinder. A couple months ago, I was in the beta test where we started from scratch, leveling up fresh accounts and progressing through the game at more of a natural pace. But also just last week, I got to go hands-on with a fully unlocked and upgraded account. I had access to everything, every Wayfinder, every weapon, and I got to see all of the content that will be in the game for the early access release that's coming out today. So with all this playtime under my belt, I thought it would be good to basically do a recap of my overall thoughts of Wayfinder, but also give you guys a clear impression of what the game is, what is there to do, what is there to see, what's the gameplay loop like, and then also just my general impressions and thoughts on the game as it stands right now. Now, as a TLDR, I just want to say from the start, I do think that there is a lot good about Wayfinder. I really enjoy the combat. I like the encounter variety, the open world, the dungeons, and just playing the game, doing the gameplay stuff has been a lot of fun. But I do still feel like there's a lot of room for growth and I think some of the bigger pain points, which we'll cover later in the video, are bound to turn some people away. Uh, this is absolutely not one of those early access releases that feels more or less like a finished game straight out the gate. No, it very much feels early access like it is content incomplete and could still use a bit more polish, which of course the hope is it'll get just that over the early access period, which they are planning to last roughly in the vicinity of six months. Now with that said, I do enjoy and like enough about what's already here to have had a fun time playing with the intention of spending more time playing the game now that it is, it is officially out, which uh, the embargo is happening the same day the game is coming out, so that would be today. Okay, so let's start off with a basic recap of the game. The way I described it last time, which I still feel holds true now that I've spent more time playing, is that Wayfinder is like a combination of the grinding, character, and progression systems of Warframe, the MMO light shared world spaces of a Destiny or Division, with a visual style reminiscent of Wildstar and World of Warcraft. You've got action combat with unique characters that you will take with you into these open world zones as well as the instance procedural dungeons where you will be grinding for resources and materials to make new weapons, progress your account, and unlock various new wayfinders. And that basically is the game. PvE, action combat, grinding for loot. That is Wayfinder, but let's dive into some more specifics. For starters, one of the game's more distinguishing features is the fact that instead of a class, you are playing as a character. This is similar to how it works in games like Warframe, or how it worked in Firefall when that thing existed, or even how it works in MOBAs. Every single character has a name, a backstory, will come with voice acting, and has four abilities with a few passives. While there are some modifications, none of these things ever change completely, at least as of now. So so if you are playing the rogue character Nis, you have the same four abilities and passives as every other person who is playing Nis. The specialization and the uniqueness and the opportunity for trying different builds and customizing your character, that comes with the weapon that you're using, your echoes, your accessories, the affinity and mastery selections, which we will go into detail about all of those uh, shortly. But yes, just think how uh, Warframes work or how MOBA characters work. That is how character selection works in Wayfinder. The game is launching with six of these to choose from to start. There is Wingrave, who is the tank healer hybrid. He's got taunts, heals, and various team support. Nis is the rogue archetype with dashing attacks and dealing shadow damage. Silo is like a mid-range throwing bombs and summoning decoys. Then there is Senja, who is a gladiator brawler with grapples and melee strikes. Kairos is a war mage with a variety of mid-range spell attacks. And then the most recently added character Veminus is an alchemist dealing poison dots and also healing. Now the character that I have played the most with all of my various hands on time with the game has been Wingrave. Like I said, he is like the tank healer hybrid with abilities that focus on healing and supporting teammates, but also doing damage, which reminds me, this is not a holy trinity game. There is no dedicated tanks, healers, and DPS. Everyone is a damage dealer, but then you have your additional abilities. So even though there are two classes currently in the game that have healing, everyone does damage. It is more so about the style of damage you do with any group utility that you might also bring in addition to the fact that you deal damage. So right out the gate from those selection of six, you will pick a Wayfinder that you find the most interesting and you better like it because 
The one that you pick is the one that you're gonna be playing at least for some time. A big part of progression in this game is all about unlocking new wayfinders, sort of like how in Warframe is all about unlocking new weapons in Warframes. It is very similar here in Wayfinder. Uh, they are pretty upfront about this as well. This isn't like a hidden thing. You get a massive warning right after the tutorial and before finalizing your selection that says, hey, character selection is permanent. From this point on, new characters will have to be crafted did or purchased in the cash shop. Crafting new characters involves grinding for rare materials to create these three memories of the Wayfinder you want to play. Combine that with a little bit of gold and you now have unlocked a new Wayfinder. Now grinding for those materials, again, is a big part of the progression in this game. It's one of those main things that you're working towards. As time goes on and you play more, you will unlock more Wayfinders, getting access to a larger roster, which you can swap between on the fly at any point. If you're out like in the open world or in the city, you can just freely change the Wayfinder that you are currently playing. The only exception is whenever you're in one of those instance dungeons or boss fights. And yes, it should be expected that this will be a bit of a grind or that you will be able to purchase Wayfinders. We know that this is the case because as of now, while the game does have a box price for early access, once it leaves early access into full release, this is going to be a free to play game. And yes, you will be able to purchase Wayfinders and weapons to skip the progression. That is how they're doing the monetization. Speaking of which, in the early access with the game's seasonal structure, they will be having roughly four seasons planned per year. They have said that with every season, they will be introducing a new Wayfinder. In fact, I spoke with the developer and they told me that they've got somewhere around 12 Wayfinders currently in the works, 12 Wayfinders in development, and they'll be releasing, as far as I know, at least one with every new season roughly four new Wayfinders a year. It seems like as long as this game does well and continues to get supported, this will be one of those games that has a massive roster of playable characters. There will be a lot to choose from. So again, very similar to Warframe. But to start out, you will just pretend it's day one, which it is today. If you're watching this video, the day it comes out, it's day one. You pick your Wayfinder, you think you've got your one you're happy with. The other half of the gameplay experience, specifically the combat equation, isn't just the Wayfinder with the four skills and passives, it's also the weapon system. And this is a really big part of the game. So the game has four weapon types or classes of weapons. There's sword and shield, two-handed melee, ranged, and dual daggers. Each weapon class has specific attack patterns with various light and heavy combos, weapon swings, and different arcs, as well as unique weapon class perks and mechanics. The classes of weapons aren't just like they attack differently, but they also play differently, very differently as well, because there are unique systems for each of those four classes of weapons. And What's even more interesting is that any Wayfinder can use any weapon. There are zero restrictions. So although most of the footage in trailers where you've seen, for example, Wingrave, I'm almost certain in every single trailer, official trailer, he's been using a sword and shield. But as Wingrave, you can also use a two-handed melee weapon, ranged weapons, and dual daggers. Even further than that, though, is that beyond the four classes of weapons, those four categories, every individual weapon has its own unique ability as as well. The weapons are sort of like Wayfinders in that they are each named, have their own lore, and come with a unique active skill solely available on that weapon. So when I started playing Wingrave, the starting sword and shield that I had access to was called Vanguard. And outside of its basic light and heavy attacks, the combo chains, and the weapon-based mechanics that every other sword and shield has, it also had the unique shield bash ability, which would deal massive impact damage to any enemies directly in front of me, also dealing a lot of of guard break damage. In combat, I would build up these charges, and then the more charges I had, the harder hitting the shield bash was. But beyond the Vanguard, like I said, there are other sword and shields, unique sword and shields, that have their very own skills. So those are Grim Harvest, that has an ability where you will lunge your sword into the ground, summoning up an eruption of bone spikes. Tooth and Claw lets you throw your shield, damaging and bouncing between enemies before returning back to you. And then there was the Radiant Dawn, that lets you empower your sword and shield with radiant energy, extending the damage and range of all of your attacks. And as you can see, each one of these sword and shields with that unique ability really opens up and adds new place. It gives you a whole new ability to add into your rotation. I could use more than just one-handed swords and shields. I could use any other weapon in the game 
and in fact, I did just that. Most of my playtime on Wingrave was spent using two-handed melee weapons. This class of weapon is a heavy hitting and deals high damage to health and resilience, which is different than how the sword and shield functions. So while in combat with the two-handed melee weapon that's also got this system called momentum, where the longer you're in combat, the more momentum you build up, the higher your momentum, the more damage your attacks deal. And then that momentum also plays into the two-handed weapon abilities. So I started out with the two-handed axe called Typhoon. Its ability Shatter would consume all of my momentum to perform a strong overhead slam directly in front of me, sort of like in a cone. Hitting an enemy with this would debuff them, causing them to take additional damage for 10 seconds. Then I switched to the two-handed sword, Titan's Bane. This ability was Molten Cleave, would have me slam my sword into the ground, which would split the earth and form a straight line of molten lava. It would deal some initial damage on impact, but then would also, for a few seconds, pulsate damage over time to anyone who continued to stand on top of it. Now, in the most recent build that I played, there were actually a total of 20 different individual weapons just like this. There were six ranged weapons, five two-handed melee weapons, five dual daggers, and four sword and shield. So there's 20 right now, but as with the Wayfinders, they are intending on adding new weapons with every single season, which is going to add a lot of variety. You know, initially, I was really concerned when I learned about how the system worked, where these Wayfinders were just characters and not classes, and they had four static active abilities and a couple of passives that would never change. But with the weapon system being as open as it is, with any character, any Wayfinder able to use any of the 20 weapons that are in the game with more to come, that combined with the other progression systems and customization in the game has really added a lot of variety to the overall gameplay experience uh, in my experience thus far with the game. On top of that, they've got future plans with the seasonal updates to add more abilities to the Wayfinders. Uh, I'm going to detail that when we discuss the seasons later in the video. But now let's talk about the, uh, the game itself, right? We've covered the Wayfinders, we've talked about how the weapon system works and briefly touched on combat. What are we doing with all of this? What is actually playing the game like? Well, the game is broken up into two main parts. There is the shared open zones and the instanced dungeons. So let's start off with the open zones. The main one in the game is the Highlands. This is a decently sized, like high fantasy themed woodland zone. It's broken up into several areas, each with their own themes and points of interest. There's the typical variety of fantasy enemies. You'll come across goblins, bandits, elementals, and wildlife. Life. There are public events of various sizes and complexity, some that you can solo, others that require groups, along with uh, various side quests and collectible resources to gather. It is a fairly standard open zone with about what you would expect. You'll walk around doing all of the above mentioned activities. There's some light exploration, some traversal elements. You've got ladders and zip lines to get around. There's a bunch of hidden secrets that you can find. But for the most part, it's pretty upfront, pretty standard open zone. It's also a shared world, meaning that you will see other people people running around, not hundreds, but think about tens along the lines once more of the shared spaces you see in a destiny or division. And you will mostly be spending time in the highlands as you move through the main, the main campaign in the game, as you do side quests, and to collect some specific things for a few of the game's progression systems. Now, in addition to the highlands, there's also this large town called Skylight. This is where you arrive shortly after the tutorial. Here you will find various useful NPCs and crafting stations for making characters, weapons, consumables, and relics, which are part of the game's sort of equipment system. There's also this echo matrix where you can craft imbuements that enhance dungeon runs. And you're also going to find the entrance to the gloom anchor here, which is tied into the game's procedural dungeon system. And like the Highlands, Skylight is also a shared space, so you will see other players. And then finally, there is the Deepwood Halt. This is the third and final of the open zones that are going to be at the game for the early access release. This one is significantly smaller and size when compared to the Highlands. And also, it doesn't really have much of anything to do. Like, there's not a lot going on here. It acts sort of more of a hub to the game's three snow-themed dungeons, or as they are called in this game, the Lost Zones. And this actually ties into one of my biggest worries or concerns for the game currently, which is just a general lack of uh, open world content. There's really only those three spaces. But anyways, I want to talk about the most substantial part of the game, and that is the dungeons. This is really the biggest chunk of 
of content the Wayfinder has to offer. So these are instance procedurally structured locations. They're called Lost Zones, and you'll be running these over and over again for resources, currencies, and loot. This is where you will be spending a majority of your playtime in the game, as it is the primary form of progression and also amounts to a bulk of what is offered for playable content. While Wayfinder does have those aforementioned open zone spaces, the Lost Zones, the dungeons, are really what this game is all about at the moment. So unlocking dungeons is done by progressing the main story quest. After the intro tutorial, you are brought to the open world, where upon completing a few tasks, you are asked to talk to some NPCs and go out to find the entrance to the Codex Halls. Now this is an actual physical location within the Highlands. So you make your way over, maybe you do some open world stuff en route, but once you arrive, you enter the dungeon, you do the run, which involves moving through rooms and hallways, killing some enemies, collecting resources, and then when you reach the end and clear the final room event, after that, the Codex Halls becomes available as an option to open and run from the Gloom Anchor that is in Skylight. And that is how unlocking dungeons for the sake of farming works in this game. There will be various steps in between, but once you reach and clear a dungeon as part of that main story quest, it then becomes available for you to run back in town, from which point you can just stay in town and keep farming them over and over, which you will be doing because that is basically the game. That is the game, farming for progression, farming for wayfinders, farming for weapons, and any other associated resources and items to power yourself up. Does that get repetitive? Well, yes, of course it does, as it does with every loot farming game. Sooner or later, it gets pretty repetitive. Now, Wayfinder's plan to try to keep things fresher longer is by making the subsequent runs of those dungeons different every time, thanks to the procedural placement of dungeon layouts. This more or less amounts to a varied combination of rooms and their connecting pieces. So you'll have some hallways that maybe lead into small rooms, and then maybe that small room has multiple hallways off of it going in different directions. On one side, you might find a big room that has multiple levels for you to go up and down with some enemies in there. There could be some hallways off of that, or maybe there isn't. Then you loop back and head in the other direction, and maybe you come across a puzzle room, or a room that has an event, or a mini boss, or some NPC, or even side quests that you can do within the dungeon. Every single dungeon has basically a set number of building blocks. You can kind of think like Legos if you want, and it's how they're placed together and how they're connected and how they are laid out, which will change from one run to the next, and that's how they are planning to keep things fresh. In total, with the early access release, they're going to have nine dungeon templates or dungeon locations. There are three in the Aurelian setting, three in the Mines setting, and three in Reaver Woods, which is that second open zone that basically, like I said, is just a hub for these areas. I should also mention one distinguishing factor is the Aurelian and the Mines have a general structure of sort of hallways and rooms or hallways and open spaces where the Reaver Woods, the snow themed dungeons are much, much more open. Lots of open space tiles that are basically placed next to each other. So each one of those locations, very distinct from each other, different tile sets, different visual identity, room types, events. There is some crossover here and there, especially in the theming between each of those groupings, but they are also each individually unique and distinct enough to be identifiable just at a glance. On top of that, variety also comes through difficulty settings, imbuements, and boss hunts. So upon successfully completing a dungeon run, you will then unlock its next difficulty tier. So you start with the first level, you clear that, you unlock level two. Each of these levels will scale up everything within it to be tankier and deadlier. The harder dungeons will give you better rewards. There's also the imbuement system, and this is pretty cool. It adds another layer of difficulty by enhancing enemies and even the dungeon itself with unique affixes. So you will craft these imbuements. There are uh, five imbuement types, and they sort of act like a resource to put into your dungeons, changing them up. So the shadow imbuement will make enemies blow up upon death. Solar will make it so that enemy attacks cause you to burn, dealing damage over time. Greed will put piles of gold in the dungeon. The more of this you grab, yeah, you get more gold, but then you're also going to take more damage throughout the rest of the run. The flora imbuement has toxic mushrooms fill the dungeon, which spawn large poison pools. And then finally, there's chaos, which has this trickster that messes up with your run, giving you various debuffs. So as you can see, there are multiple imbuements, each doing different things. Adding an imbuement to your run makes it harder in exchange for better rewards. Eventually, though, 
you unlock the ability to apply multiple imbuements to a single run and these multiple combinations don't just like stack the two buffs together every single combination of these five with combo combos of two every one of those actually adds an entirely new unique dungeon debuff so there are a ton of different imbuement affixes and debuffs for you to get and you will want to be doing this because this is actually one of the primary ways to collect the pieces needed for you to craft wayfinders so working your way up the difficulty tiers and working your way up to be able to do those multiple imbuements on a single dungeon run that's what your that's your ultimate goal that you're moving towards and then finally lastly there are boss hunts every one of those nine dungeon locations will have one to two unique boss hunts for you to take on you first have to collect the materials to craft a unique key but then once you do you can farm that boss over and over again just like the dungeons you'll be farming the bosses depending on what it is you're looking for for resources currencies loot whatever typically most dungeon runs would take me anywhere in the ballpark of 10 to 15 minutes more or less depending on the layout of the dungeon how many side activities i engage with and my just overall pacing of playing and with that i also want to add like the basic flow to a game experience with the time that i played so far looks something like this log on i would run some dungeons do a couple boss hunts and then go out into the open world to do side quests and events collect some stuff now exactly which dungeons i would do what boss hunts what resources i was looking for that was all entirely dependent on whatever my crafting goal was whatever i was working towards whether it was to make a new specific weapon to craft a new wayfinder or to get any of the things needed for the game's other progression speed systems speaking of which let's cover the progression systems quickly accessories these are wayfinders version of gear they are various relics like rings scarfs horns trinkets basically various artifacts that you'll find and these are more or less just stat sticks so they, they're gonna drop while fighting enemies or you can find them while opening chests a lot of these can even be crafted and it's a pretty straightforward system they will come in levels rarities and you will be equipping the best version of whatever relic you have that has this particular stats that you're looking for beyond that relics can also be part of a set and with that you'll get additional bonuses the more of these you have equipped then there are echoes echoes are like a gem system you will collect these and they also provide stat boosts increasing your health weapon and ability damage crit and other various stats there's also an entire class of echoes that add ability modifiers so these can be things like using your weapons ability will drop a bomb that deals damage if you lose half of your guard break it creates a shield that equal to 25 percent of your health or there was one where melee combo finishers would make a large aoe blast at the end there's actually quite a lot of these in the game and while i never saw any of them with that would directly affect the abilities of your character a lot of them were just tied to general combat attacks and defensive things and they again really helped enhance your character adding additional effects and the echo system works pretty much like it works in warframe so basically echoes are slotted into your character your weapon and your accessories and each of these will have a set echo capacity so the echoes themselves have a type as well as a cost again the system works really similar to warframe where you have to match the echo type to a proper slot doing so will cut its cost in half which in turn lets you fill in more echoes before you reach your echo capacity and echoes can be upgraded if you find one you like and you just want to make it stronger you can feed other echoes into it increasing its star rating there's also this affinity system with three categories for you to progress in which are instinct discipline and focus this progression can be done for both your character as well as your weapon with each category enhancing a particular combination of offensive and defensive stats there are also perks the further you progress into each one of these categories you unlock additional passive bonuses for your character now for the abilities as i mentioned every single wayfinder has a set four abilities those never change although as you level your character you do get points and those points can be used to enhance those abilities there's just no like branching path there are no options here it's just that every one of your four abilities will have three tiers of upgrades and then depending on what you want to focus on you will upgrade the skills that you use the most or the ones that you find most useful it is pretty bare bones although in the future they are planning to change things up by introducing more ability options all right so that is a high level overview of all of the game systems the content type what there is to do the progression all of that now with that covered i want to talk about my general impressions and specifically my likes and dislikes what i think is good 
bad and could use some improvement. So let's start off with the good stuff. Number one is the visuals. I actually, although I find this a little contentious, I personally really like the visual style of this game. I like the art direction. This combination with both Wildstar and World of Warcraft with these oversized buildings and oversized armor and weapons and over the top cartoony characters. I actually find it very appealing. I think it looks really good. This more stylized visual also has a better chance at longevity. It's just more likely to look better for a longer period of time than games that go for those realistic looking graphics. But that argument aside, I just think visually the game is appealing. I have a lot of moments where I'm going through this world and I'm thinking like, I just feel like that looks really cool. I really like the presence of the environment, the setting, all of that. I, I just generally find it appealing. The combat I also think is really good. I would actually say it's one of the stronger points of this game across the board. It just feels good to do your basic combo attack patterns, mixing it in, weaving with your class abilities, various chain combos, chaining from light attack to heavy attacks, doing drop attacks, blocking and dodging, all of that stuff I just think feels really good. It's pretty snappy. And when the game is running well and when there aren't any network issues, I feel like combat just across the board feels pretty good. Playing into that, the weapon system, obviously the weapons also add to the combat because every single weapon class is quite distinct from each other, not just in the attack combos, whether they're melee or ranged, but they all have unique mechanics. Every single weapon class plays different, but then each individual weapon with those 20 weapons total have their own skills as well. So every single Wayfinder you play has 20 potential additional skills that you can slot in depending on the weapon that you're using. And I think that really adds a lot to the game. I also really like the open world and it's a real shame that there isn't more of it because the one particular zone that's really built up, the Highlands, it's really cool. There's a lot of different spots to see. I like the verticality. I like the traversal options. There are like what are kind of jumping puzzles. They're not in the sense that they're not going to reward you for anything, but there's areas where if you're jumping properly, you can navigate and maybe you'll find a hidden chest or a hidden uh, progression item, a hidden resource, whatever. They've got their ladders and those zip lines that I mentioned. And it's just a cool play space. It's fairly decent size. It just absolutely kills me that we basically only have one open zone area because the second snowy one, like I mentioned, doesn't really count. It's basically just a hub for those dungeon entrances. Speaking of the dungeons, I think the dungeon system is also well thought out. I really enjoy how they do these tile sets, how they've got these different regions with the different dungeons. And then those dungeons are mixed up because of the procedural placement of the rooms and hallways and all that stuff. And I didn't really go into it much, but the dungeons besides like the different layouts and stuff, they are full of different activities, different side events. There are like puzzles for you to solve as well. And those properly solving those puzzles will give you rewards or opening up a, 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 an additional boss fight as you move through the dungeon. A lot of really cool stuff, a lot of interesting things to see and discover with all of the dungeon tile sets. However, like the open world, it does feel like they are just fairly limited in variety. And I would really like them to build that out. And then also on the good side, at least tentatively, I felt when I played through the beta period, starting from scratch the pacing of progression felt good the time it took to like work up and unlock a new weapon or upgrade your stuff um you know feed in echoes upgrade your items going through the process of grinding for a new wayfinder or weapon uh, it seemed like it was pretty good but uh, how they pace that how long it takes to do that stuff that can all that's all very much so subject to change so that one's only tentatively on the good list on to the bad list um for starters combat I know I said it's good, but my other concern is that it might be a little too shallow to stay engaging in the long term because yeah, every single Wayfinder does only have four abilities and your basic attack combos, I guess a fifth ability when you consider your weapon. And already in the in the time that I played this game so far, I really feel like I've gotten the hang out of playing Wingrave. Although from what I understand, just like how DE does with Warframe, they are intending to keep things fresh by having you play different characters. that That is the intention here. Um, you are expected to play other white wayfinders, but even if you don't play other wayfinders, you're also then expected to work towards unlock and play with other weapons. And there will be new weapons and wayfinders coming in every single season. As a base combat system, it does feel like it, it, it lacks some of the depth here, but it seems like that depth will be coming even more so if you will play multiple wayfinders. But if you are intending, or if there's only one wayfinder you like playing, like if you only want to play as Wingrave with the one-handed sword and shield, and there's only one out of those four one-handed sword and shields that you like the ability of, yeah, the base combat depth 
will probably get pretty repetitive because it isn't too deep. That would be too shallow if you are not intending to mix things up and play multiple wayfinders with multiple weapon combinations. Speaking of that, I also feel like there's there might be a lack oh, there is right now a lack of content variety. I was really banking on them entering early access. I was hoping for like four or five open world zones that were similar to the Highlands, but now we know the Highlands is basically the only single open world area because yes, Reaver Woods is just a tiny hub that lets you walk into the dungeon entrances. I'm actually going to assume that if this game gets a lot of negative re reviews, this will be one of the, the combat depth with the characters only having four abilities right now and the fact that there is truly only one open world zone. I'm going to assume this is where most of the negative criticism is going to come from barring any performance or network issues that people might have. I feel like if people start out, they do the tutorial, they get introduced to Skylight and then, you know, they after Skylight, they walk into the Highlands, which is really big. It really sets a positive tone. The first time you come across this, it's like, wow, this is really cool. This Highland area is really big. I can't wait to keep going and see what's next. All that's next is a tiny zone and then that's it as of now in this early access. And I think that is gonna be a major letdown for a lot of people. And if you feel like that might be a major letdown for you, it might just be worth waiting until the game is out of early access and officially releases. And I say that while totally understanding that yes, a lot of what this game is about will be grinding those dungeons repetitively. But I feel like if they can flesh out the open world by adding more of these zones, that is gonna add so much more to the game. And I hope that that's something they can do before leaving early access. I also say performance was pretty much spotty through all the play tests, even the recent one that I played. I think especially whenever I was in a shared environment, like when I was in the open world and other people were around, I noticed some issues with performance. Performance was always best when I was solo in a dungeon, and that is a concern, and I hope it's something that they can address. So that is an overview of the positives and negatives. I also want to touch on the cash shop before we leave. Yes, this game does have a cash shop, although to get the, into the early access version, you do have to pay for the game. Once it leaves early access, it is going to be entirely free to play, and with that, they have said they're following Warframe's model of monetization, although they have stated no build timers like Warframe, but a lot of the other stuff that Warframe does to monetize, they will be doing in Wayfinder as well. Now there was a cash shop in the recent preview build. Items for sale included Wayfinders, weapons, housing furniture. The game does have a housing system. I didn't really touch on it because I don't really care too much for it, but yes, there is going to be housing in the game. They were also selling weapon charms, so little dangly things you could hang on the side of your weapon. And those were actually all of the items for sale in the cash shop in the version of the game that I changed, that I played. This, of course, is subject to change. What are you buying this with? Well, rune silver is the premium currency. This ranged from 500 rune silver for $4.99 or $5 to 19.5 thousand rune silver for $149. Boy, I love seeing prices go that high, huh? It does the typical thing of increasing the bonus rune silver that you get when you buy those more expensive bundles. Assuming you're not purchasing the highest bundle for the most bonus rune silver, prices for wayfinders ranged from roughly 15 to 19 dollars while weapons range between 7 and 12 dollars and these would be unlocking the level one versions of those weapons so you would still have to progress those this feels pretty in line for what i expect from a free-to-play game kind of weird that it's going to be in here with the early access version where you have to pay for entry but it is what it is and again bear in mind things like prices the items for sale all of that could change at any point between now and the full release. Again, it it's a live service game. It could change whenever. It could change every other day if they wanted it to. They have said, and it is clear, that everything that's in the cash shop can also be acquired by playing the game. But of course, you'll be grinding because it is a grinding game. So how much grind does it take? How they balance the grinding and how much it how much you want to buy things instead of grinding for it. That's a key thing into how fair people feel that your free to play model is and the monetization is. And that is entirely up to debate. It's also incredibly subjective depending on the player, how much time you have and a lot of other factors. Oh, and maybe unsurprisingly, they are also going to have a season path, although they do have this interesting mechanic of having branching pathways where you can pick the direction and the items and unlocks that you want to work towards, which I think is kind of neat. Now, finally, before we wrap things up, let's talk about their future content plans. Realize with a lot of things as well, this is also something that's subject to change. You've got these games that say, hey, we're gonna have these updates, here's our roadmap. That all really depends on how successful or not the game is. If Wayfinder comes out, it's incredibly successful. There's a good chance they live up to this content roadmap, these things that they're saying they're going to add. If the game comes out and it flops, 
expect to see some delays or cancellations of parts of the system. But let's assume everything goes smoothly. Here's what they're going to be adding to Wayfinder in the coming months and years. An awakening system that lets you further enhance your weapons and Wayfinders, basically increasing their stats as well as their echo capacity, which in turn further increases their stats. They're also going to be adding this archetype level system. And this is really interesting. So basically, for starters, there's going to be a talent tree for every archetype in the game. Now, every single class in the game, besides being their class, with their four abilities and their passives like we've gone over, they also fill an archetype. So for example, Wingrave and Senja are both considered war masters. And as a war master, they have particular passive abilities. Whereas Nis and Kairos are both considered Arcanists. So with these archetypes, they're gonna be adding skill trees with branching nodes that can do things like grant increasing stats, increasing your echo budget, adding more sockets, adding new major talents, eventually leading into these archetype skills that you can swap in and out for your ability set. So for every single, so if you progress, if you're progressing the uh, the War Master archetype tree, you're going to be unlocking new skills that you can use on any War Masters, which as of now, Wingrave and Senja. So this is going to be an entirely new system of progression, but also an entirely new system of having skill variety of not just being tied to those four base skills, which as is currently the case that will be changing in the future if they stick to this plan. They're also adding further progression with account levels and armory levels, which are basically tied to weapons. There's going to be additional content for the main story quest. They're going to be adding new live events, hard mode versions of the boss hunts. They'll be adding raids to the game, which they are implying are more than three players. Three players is the dungeon cap for the regular dungeons. There's going to be a job board, which sounds like daily quest maybe or something, and brand new weapons and wayfinders as we've covered. There's also some new systems that they're planning, like traversal mechanics, which include mounts and hook shots. They're going to be doing housing updates, introducing neighborhoods, guild neighborhoods, shared plots you can share with your friends. They'll be adding even life skill systems, things like fishing, for example. So there is a lot on the docket. There's a lot that they have planned for Wayfinder, but to wrap it all up, to bring it home, I'll say, yes, I think as a base, this game is fun. It's good. I've enjoyed my time with it. If anything, it feels a little content light. I'm worried about performance. If perform if the game doesn't run well for people, it's not going to matter if they would enjoy the content. Otherwise, people don't like playing games that don't run well. And I think that when people get to the realization that after they go through the to Skylight, after they go into the Highlands and they see this open zone and it's so cool, I'm going to this area, I'm unlocking this dungeon, I can farm this dungeon, but I want to do more open world. I'll keep progressing the main story quest. And then when they realize like the Highlands is basically the only open zone, I think that's going to be a tipping point for a lot of people. And I think that's probably going to result in if the game does get a lot of negative reviews, I think that's going to be one of the simplicity of the combat, the current state of the Wayfinders only having four skills, which will change, but that's how it is right now. And the 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 just so few open world areas i think those are the three major pain points that could result in a negative reception but if they add to that if they can address and fix these issues the base of the game i think is really fun the combat is really fun and i just like the general structure of this game give me five six give me ten open zones add more dungeon tile sets to with randomization keep adding new wayfinders and weapons. A lot of that core, the meat of this is really good uh, as a start. But yes, it does feel slightly light for this early access release. I was hoping for a little bit more, but I like what's here. I do intend to spend more time playing and we'll see where the game goes in the future. But that's gonna do it for it me today. Thank you for watching this sort of review of Wayfinder, of what I've played so far, of the early access version that is launching right now. And I hope things turn out good. I hope we'll see what happens, but that's it. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Take it easy.